Hello guys and girls and welcome back to another episode of Seb Talks Sports, sponsored by Hoopin and Lutin, the place to go to for your favourite new and vintage jerseys and apparel from all things basketball. Today on Seb Talks Sports, I've got a throwback episode as it's from an interview I recorded during the summer of 2020 with an eight-year NFL veteran safety. After being selected to the Pro Bowl in 2007, this man ended his career boasting nearly a decade of experience in the pros on some of the league's most prestigious franchises, recording eight straight winning seasons in the process. It's none other than the stalwart safety himself, Ken Hamlin. Enjoy! My guest today is a former Pro Bowl safety, an eight-year NFL veteran who played for the Seattle Seahawks, Dallas Cowboys, Baltimore Ravens, and Indianapolis Colts, contributing to eight straight winning seasons and seven playoff appearances. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome Ken Hamlin to Seb Talk Sports. Ken, how are you? I'm doing great, doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing very good. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, man, appreciate you. I mean, you know, I always, if we're talking about sports and being able to definitely talk about it since we can't watch it now, it's got to be a pleasure, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so let's go right back to the beginning. So what would you say were your earliest memories of playing sport in general? Because I know you used to play baseball and track as well when you were a kid. And how did you end up becoming a safety out of every position? Playing baseball, was that was all the way back from Pee Wee Ball and Little League. And I always had a love for that. Played it in high school. The safety position stuck with me more than anything because I played a lot of different positions in high school and football. It was just the one that sort of fit the mode and the, and the type of uh, player that, that I was. It came about to me playing that position and playing it not just in high school, but throughout college and in, in the NFL. I'll get to your college career in a sec. But firstly, it takes an incredible amount of hard work and dedication to kind of have the prosperous and long career you had both in college and the NFL. So was there anyone that installed that in you growing up, either football or non-football related? Who would you say was your inspiration? Well, I think I had a few people along the way who sort of gave me that drive. I mean, my dad, I mean, he forcibly made it to where quitting wasn't an option, getting up and actually putting in the work. Growing up, I didn't get the pleasure of playing what I wanted to play. If I wanted to play a sport, you know, there's always a registration fee or something like that. Mm -hmm. I had to pay that fee. I had to find a way, whether I was seven, eight, nine years old, cutting yards and, and raking leaves and doing odd, odd jobs like that to pay for that in order to play. So you find a little bit more of a respect for it when you have to put in that work and, and actually have to put in work to even be able to play that sport. Mm, I think it was definitely worth it in the end, let's say that. <laughs> definitely, definitely, um, definitely. <laughs> okay, so your college career was just amazing. I mean, you were an All-SEC in both your freshman and sophomore seasons, a first-team All-American in your junior year, a Jim Thorpe Award and Bronco Nagurski Award nominee. You ended up becoming a second-round pick in the 2003 NFL Draft, and you were easily the best Arkansas defensive back since Hall of Famer Steve Atwater. So that's quite a statement. How much did you enjoy your time on the Razorbacks? How much did it mean to you? And which lesson that you learned there was most valuable in turning pro? One of the biggest bonuses that I had going to Arkansas was having Steve Atwater as a person that I could reach out to and who came to some of the games and would give me pointers. I think that was a huge, a huge plus. Also, and not to discount it at all, to have Kenoy Kennedy, who I got to play and at least watch for a year, play right before he left and went to the NFL, was there and got to really get a lot of pointers from him and, and how he played the game. Also, another guy who played a position at a high level, had a great college and NFL career. So I got pointers from two guys who played a position physically, went out and definitely tried to make examples at that position and tried to set a standard for that safety position and how it was played during that time. So it made it to where it was an easy transition for me. And then, of course, all my teammates around me, whatever, especially my class that came in, we all had a sort of a chip on our shoulder on how we mm -hmm. wanted to play the game and how we wanted to make an impact. We definitely tried to show it. Absolutely. And that mentorship was obviously very valuable coming forward because we go to the 2003 NFL draft. You're sat there in the second round after a prestigious college career at Arkansas. And then your phone rings and it's new general manager, Bob Bergson, who takes you with the 42nd overall pick and makes you a Seahawk for the next four years ahead of Super Bowl champions, Anquan Bolden, Osa Yumanura, Asante Samuel, Robert Mathis, David Tyree, like all of these Super Bowl champions <coughs> came after you, but you were picked before them. So what was your draft experience like and how much did it mean to you and your family? 
it meant the world to my family. It meant the world to my, myself. I really didn't know what to expect. I didn't have anybody around me or in my family who had went through that type of process and could give me any pointers on what to expect or anything. So it was it was all brand new, wide open to the whole experience. To be able to have my family come and sort of sit there with me and sort of go through the, the grueling time of waiting to get a call. But at the same time, you find the enjoyment in it. I think it was cool. I mean, I think it, it definitely left an impression, even though I went 42nd pick, I felt like I should have been drafted earlier. So that left an even bigger chip on my shoulder of, okay, basically every team passed up on me once, wanted to show and sort of prove that that was a mistake. Now that you get drafted, now it's all about, okay, I made it to this level. You don't want to get complacent and say, okay, now that I made it, you can relax. No, now that you made it, now you got to put in even more work go at it even harder because you don't want to be one of the guys who makes it and is out in a year or two, which happens. So now the pressure is really on, you know, you've done all this work to get there and you would think now you could be able to be like, whoo, I made it. But now the pressure is really on because now Mm -hmm. you really got to hold your position and, and, uh, and make sure that you can have a long career instead of something, something that's short lived. Mm. I think those teams that passed on you did make a mistake because, like I said at the top, every single year you played in the NFL, you contributed towards a team that had a winning record, which is kind of unheard of. And seven of those eight teams obviously went to the playoffs. So that's quite a unique stat in the NFL, to say the least, given how ever-changing the league is. But you clearly offered those franchises a lot of stability. What was it like to experience eight straight winning seasons at the (laughs) highest level of professional football? And which particular season and team was your favourite to play on? Just like you just said, that's not always the case, uh, you know, get, having winning season. I have a friend of mine, and we, we talk about it quite a bit, but a friend of mine who played 13 years in the league, one winning season. Wow. One season. That sort of tells you, I mean, it's not guaranteed. That's the one thing that Seattle team really instilled in me is we were a team that were molding things to become a winning team. We hadn't really just hit that stride as soon as I got there. With it. We, but during that season, players were being put together that had that mindset. You had the older guys in the Sean Alexanders, the Matt Hasselbecks, you know, the Walt Jones who were already there. But then you started, we started bringing in pieces like myself, Marcus Trufant. We brought in other guys from other teams, Deion Branch. You know, we had all these different pieces coming together but the mindset was the same of guys who wanted to win it wasn't about just a check it was about coming together and trying to win something and I I think you saw that year by year just making it to the playoff isn't enough okay we got to go another we got to go further we got to go further we got to go further and I think that's the one thing that sort of stood with me of course the year that we went to the Super Bowl was a bittersweet one because I wasn't able to play in the game that was a great season the first year in Dallas I think we ended up going 13 and 3 or something like that we ended up having 13 guys in the Pro Bowl which was unheard of. I mean, just to have that many guys. I mean, and every guy earned it. That's the biggest part about it. I think that those guys put in a lot of work from the offensive line, defensive line, secondary, and, and beyond. I, I think those guys put in a lot of work to really earn it. So I think that was another year that I could say that that was a special year, even though we didn't cap it off with a Super Bowl run, but made it to the playoffs, number one seed. I feel like that was one of the years we didn't have all of the veteran experience that we would need to really take it to another level. So I'm going to talk about the Pro Bowl in a sec because that was obviously a huge point in your career. But before that, I want to say that during your career, you had a total of 15 interceptions, which many high-level defensive backs can say, but not a lot of corners and safeties in NFL history are able to say that they've picked off one of the greatest, if not the greatest quarterback of all time in Tom Brady, future first ballot Hall of Famer. Now, I know it was a Hail Mary attempt, but but it still stands. You picked off Tom Brady. So can you describe how it felt to achieve that and send the game into overtime? Those ones right there are the ones where you're like, do I knock this down? Um, (laughs) But at the same time, you're like, these opportunities don't come around Mm. often especially in my position, you don't just get an opportunity to intercept and a guy like Tom Brady, but you don't get an opportunity to intercept the ball, period. So when the opportunity is there and you don't have a whole bunch of crowd around you with the whole Hail Mary situation, you got to take every advantage. Tom Brady was a guy I had to play against a few times. Great player. Peyton Manning played against the Brett Favre's and all that type of stuff. So you got to take every chance you can to put one of those so you can show those type of stats and those type of game balls. Whatever. So, so I'm one of the few that has a ball that was picked off of Tom Brady. So that's a cool stat. 
your 2007 season was a Pro Bowl season, and I can see that jersey behind you on the wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, your 2007 season with the Cowboys was probably your best throughout your entire career. So mm-hmm. you have a total of five interceptions to secure your spot on the Pro Bowl roster in Miami, where you were joined by some of the greatest players in NFL history that year. So, how did it feel to play with all of the very best players in the sport? What was the camaraderie like with your fellow NFC teammates? And of course, you were obviously reserved for the late Sean Taylor, who was tragically murdered just months before. So you had a very unique Pro Bowl experience. So what was that like emotionally speaking as well? I was just about to mention that too. So of course, Sean Taylor, the type of player he was, the tragedy that happened with him, to be able to play with a close friend of mine and teammate, Roy Williams, we had a whole group of guys. I mean, like you said, the best of the best. And that's the that's what it's all about. Of course, you want to compete for a Super Bowl every year. But at the same time, when you are, when you are being talked about with a lot of the, the great players in the league, and there are some great players who have never got a Pro Bowl or never mm-hmm. got put into that all pro status or whatever. So that's always an honor when you're talking about some of the best in the league and to know that this league is not built of millions of people who've played it. You always got to take all of those accolades and and, and those honors and really just put them on a pedestal because it's a big accomplishment. Absolutely. And obviously, you didn't only play with great players at the Pro Bowl. You obviously played with some unbelievable talent in the regular season and playoffs. So you played with Hall of Famers, Ray Lewis, Ed Reed, Terrell Owens, 2005 MVP, Sean Alexander, and then Super Bowl champions, Peyton Manning, Dwight Freeney, Robert Mathis, Terrell Suggs, Demarcus Ware, Reggie Wayne, like some of the best players of all time, basically. But if you had to choose one, who would you say is the single best player you've ever played with? And (coughs) for safety, who was your toughest ever opponent? Sean was a um, special guy. I mean, to do what he did and how he did it, we had an amazing offensive line. Two of the guys that are in the Hall of Fame now, Steve Hutchinson and Walt Jones, having that to run behind is definitely any running back's uh, dream. But Sean just, he just knew how to slide. He knew how to find the holes. His eyes, he used them very well. And of course, me being on the sideline watching him do it, it was an honor to be able to call him a teammate. I give a lot of respect to Ed Reed, what he does, how he does it. If I had to pick one per one of the person I say DeMarcus Ware me and him never left the field you have a lot of players who on third down they come out or Mm. linemen and how they rotate that was one guy where me and him we stayed on the field every down we just had a cool thing going and and the way he played the game I mean it it was beneficial to me (laughs) yeah and you got a guy who's rushing the quarterback so it always looked good when he was out there and knowing that he's out there and he was healthy and he was chasing the quarterback because I knew my job on the back end was going to be a little bit easier so Toughest had to go up against St. Louis Rams twice a year. Mike Martz with that whole, depending on what quarterback, Trent Green or whoever you had a quarterback, but then you had Isaac Bruce, Torrey Holt, Marshall Falk, an array of slot receivers that they put out there. But they had a they had an offense that never would line up in the same formation twice in mm. a game. Your mind would have to really speed up and figure things out. Player wise, I had to play against and with T.O., which was tough. Guys like Steve Smith, small guy but huge heart. He played mm. big. Having to play, I mean, I just think about it. a guy like me, whatever size wise and everything, had to play up against a guy like Jerome Bettis and having to <laughs> tackle him. And you know, and, and, you know, so and to be able to say it, I look back at it now because it's, it's like you know, crazy to see that I played with a lot of those like giants, like mm. those, those guys. And I mean, that's why I tell people a lot of time, people look at me and be like, Oh, you played football? I'm like, Listen, you can never, you can never judge a person's heart and the size of a person's heart. I've always had respect for a lot of guys that I played with who were smaller guys who brought their lunch pail every time they came. As far as competitive playing up against that, I mean, it was a challenge every day. So obviously, as well as players, you've played on some great coaches. The list is just ridiculous. Like five-time Super Bowl champ and 1995 NFL Coach of the Year, Ray Rhodes. Two-time Super Bowl champs, Jim Caldwell, and then Mike Holmgren, Wade Phillips, John Harbaugh. These are some of the best football minds in NFL history. But which coach had the biggest impact on your game in the secondary? And which lesson that you learned during your NFL career from a coach of yours did you find most valuable? Having Holmgren and Ray Rhodes, Mm. especially first coming in, was huge. Ray kept me grounded. Even though I was going into training camp, having a good training camp, he would would constantly tell me not to smell my own piss, (laughs) which which basically meant you're here, but you haven't made it yet. Don't think you've done anything yet. And then me and Mike Holmgren, we had a great relationship. His whole thing was that he was going to have to coach a whole bunch of years because nobody else was going to put up with my stuff. He was worried differently, but they knew what they were going to get out of me. They knew the type of worker that I was. They knew type of person that, as far as putting in the work whatever during practice after practice they knew what they were getting out of me and I would say another guy who made a huge impact would be Todd Bowles still coaching he was my secondary coach in Dallas and the dude is a mind he knows the stuff simplifies it to where you don't have to really overthink whatever the game you can be out there and not have to think too much and just play and he made that game a lot quicker for a lot of us 
Okay, I'm going to end with some quick fire questions. You ready? Okay. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Twitter or Instagram? Instagram. Biggie or Tupac? Ooh. Sheesh. Biggie. Favorite sports movie? Tom Hanks. He's the coach with the girls. Uh, oh, A League of Their Own. Yeah, A League yeah. of Their Own. I love that movie. <laughs> it's hilarious. As a former safety, who is the greatest safety of all time? Greatest safety of all time. I'd have to say Ronnie Lott probably be up there. The dude played it lights out. And as a player who spent the first four years of your career in Seattle, I have to ask, Super Bowl 49, second and goal, should the Seahawks have ran the ball, yes or no? I was at that game. I, oh, I, was no. doing the, uh, I actually was doing the pregame show for uh, Sky Sports. We were at the game watching up in the booth. Of course they should have ran the ball. 198% whatever they should have ran the ball. I don't care who made the call to <laughs> pass the ball. They still should have changed the call mm. and ran the ball. There is no other discussion, whatever. The ball should have been handed off to Beast Mode and he should have been ready. Ken, thank you so much for your time. I've had a blast. Where can people find you on social media? Twitter and Instagram, Ken underscore Hamlin. Just about to launch my cigar brand. So mm. I'll be putting a lot of stuff out on that. So yeah, Ken underscore Hamlin. You can find everything about what's going on. Good stuff. I'll make sure to leave your links below so people can find you and uh, follow along. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. That was my interview with the brilliant Ken Hamlin. From his prestigious college career at Arkansas and status as a second round NFL draft pick to making the Pro Bowl in 2007 and enjoying seven separate playoff appearances, Ken's list of on-field accomplishments is seemingly endless and it was an absolute pleasure having him join me on Seb Talk Sports. If you'd like to keep up to date with Ken on his social media channels as well as check out his cigar brand, then you can do so by checking out the links in the description of this episode. I've got many more great guests coming from very soon so stay tuned right here on Seb Talks Sports. Catch you soon guys!